much. From the Boo School, Rog and Rajan, let's look at the book right now. This is an outstanding book. Fault Lines, as Nora Rubini says, it is a must read. It's in English. It is decidedly non-mathy, and it is page by page, incredibly smart, written at the beginning of the crisis, and now he's written another gem as we continue through this crisis rolling on to uh, Europe. We welcome uh, from the Booth School, Raghun Rajan. Professor, uh, good noon to you. Uh, likewise. What was the genesis of your wonderful foreign affairs article, The True Lessons of the Recession? How did this gem happen? Well, uh, thanks for calling it a gem. Uh, my, my sense was that uh, we had increasing voices saying what we need is stimulus, uh, more stimulus, monetary stimulus, more fiscal stimulus, and that's the way out. And to me, it looked like what we were doing was injecting an old racehorse with more and more drugs and hoping that it would perform to its own old ability. I think what we really need to do is diagnose the problem with the racers. How do we make it young again, capable of racing, as opposed to just stimulate it with, with drugs? That's, that's sort of the analogy that I had in mind when I wrote this piece, and basically saying a lot of the problems in the countries that got into trouble were deep underlying structural problems. They were being masked by varieties of spending, whether it was construction spending or whether it was government spending. And to really get at the, uh, at the problem, to fix it, we need to understand what those underlying problems were and get, uh, tackle them directly rather than uh, indulge in yet another bout of spending, hoping that will revive these economies. We've got a couple key sentences from this foreign affairs article. Let's bring up one, uh, Elian, on uh, income inequality. And you can see here the model, I, I just love this so much, the true lessons of the recession, the difference between median incomes and incomes of the bottom 10% has barely budged. The top is running away from the middle and the middle is merging with the bottom. Uh, Professor, I would suggest that's the insight of the essay is it's about the top and about everybody else. How do we get everybody else to boost up to that constructive, that optimistic level? Well, uh, the key word is boost up. Uh, what we have in the dialogue is, uh, is often let's pull them down so that we're all even. And my sense is that's really the wrong way to go about this. We need to make more people participate in the growth process because the growth process creates enough for everybody. And the way to do that is <clears throat> fix the underlying problems that, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, that hit our workforce. The first uh, is too many people don't have the education or the skills for the work, for the kind of jobs that are being produced by the modern economy. Second, we don't have the support systems, whether it be uh, aid in colleges, financial aid, or whether it be aid to go look for work, or uh, whether it be information, but the kinds of jobs mm -hmm. that are available. So doing things like that, making it more possible for the workforce to get the kinds of jobs that they, they can do, uh, and, and they will do if given the appropriate uh, support structures, that that to me seems to be the better way of intervening in this time rather than Nestle spending more money right. mindlessly. And then just since you've written your essay, Dean Baker on the left and Kevin Hassett on the right joining together to write an essay this weekend on the pain of unemployment, the political rally, uh, reality professor of we've got to do something about jobs. How do you respond to, say, someone like Professor Krugman or Professor DeLong who suggests we need stimulus now because of the heartbreak and the challenges of the labor economy? Can't we double barrel this and have what we saw from well, Professor Krugman and from what you're saying? I, I think you, you can try, but, but the, uh, what I worry about is we create make work jobs. Uh, jobs that uh, you know are around for a year. At the end of the year, we're going to say, "Oh, uh, these jobs are going to go away. We need more stimulus <clears throat> to keep these jobs going." W we saw that happening in Japan. Japan essentially created construction jobs by paving the entire country with concrete. They've got bridges everywhere, roads everywhere. But yet they're still in a defunct because they didn't address the underlying fundamental issues. So you can't run away from the long run. The long run will eventually hit you. And so until you create sustainable jobs, we're not going right. to come out of this. This is not just a simple <clears throat> matter of creating a job for a day. 
Bring up uh, chart number um, five, if you would, Ellie, and I'm, I'm gonna rip up the script here a little bit. Bring up chart number five, okay, here's GDP. And the way Professor Rajan identifies this is the end of easy growth. Is our goal, Professor, to get back to easy growth, or do we need to find a new normal, which is harder, more rigorous, more honest growth? I, I think the word honest is the right one. It is sustainable growth. In a sense, the, the way I like to think about it is industrial countries are back in the position of emerging markets. Uh, it's not about uh, you know, just keeping the pace of growth going. It's about finding new sources of growth which can employ the kinds of people who are now being put out of jobs by technology, by competition from abroad. We need to find those new sources of growth and they aren't simply government spending uh, on make work jobs, digging holes and filling them up. Uh, when you look, Professor, uh, at all that's said and done about inequality and about the labor economy in this country, is there any public policy you would advocate now? No, I, I think you, you have to start thinking about how to remedy this because the worse it gets, the worse inequality gets, the harder it gets to fix. And clearly a whole range of issues, some of which the administration is taking up, uh, including a focus on improving the quality of education across our schools, uh, improving access to colleges. I mean, colleges are frightfully expensive for the middle class now, and finding ways so that they're affordable, but finding ways that students actually take courses that end up in good jobs, as opposed to courses that leave them with $100,000 in debt and no job. That's the kind of analysis, that's the kind of thinking we need to do. And there aren't easy solutions. There's no one magic bullet which will get everybody to the right it, place. But there are lots of experiments we can, we can indulge in and we should, we should actually learn from them and, and implement them. Have you very quickly, Professor, have you talked to any politicians about your essay? Is anybody listening in Washington? <laughs> Well, I, I, I talk uh, all the time uh, uh, to, uh, to people, but there are informal conversations. No, nothing formal. Let's come back. Uh, Professor Raghun Rajan with us from the Booth School of Chicago. We're going to come back, continue the discussion. Of course, we have to speak with the professor uh, as a former chief economist for the IMF about your 150 beeps on 210. Raghun Rajan with us from Chicago, and we are in celebration. I want to get the full title, The True Lessons of the recession, but we must turn to Europe as we speak to the former head of economic research for the International uh, Monetary Fund. Uh, Raj, um, in the FT today, Lord Skidelsky and Marcus Miller, let's bring up uh, that op-ed, uh, looking for stimulus, looking for support for a country in such desperate straits as Greece, orderly exit from the euro to regain competitiveness looks to be the best option. It's in the interest of Greece and its credit read French and German banks, that the devaluation be controlled. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I think there are lots of unknowns that the Greece leaves the euro. First, uh, managing the exit itself is difficult. As you just said before we started talking, there are already runs on the Greek banks. So uh, if they do leave, don't have support from the euro area, uh, that could be a great calamity in, in Greece. Uh, second, the idea that uh, depreciation of your exchange rate, once you have your own exchange rate, uh, depreciating it allows you to become more competitive, relies on unions not seeing that their wages have fallen and not demanding higher wages over time. That requires a lot of discipline. Whether Greece has that discipline is something we don't know. In other words, ultimately everything depends on Greece becoming a lot more competitive and starting to grow. Competitiveness <clears throat> means they either become more productive or their wages go down, or a combination of, of both. Now, that can be done the hard way, which is doing it within the euro area and trying to reduce wages. It can be done apparently the easy way, which is what some commentators suggest, right. which is move off the euro, let your exchange rate go, and therefore you've brought down wages. But whether that will happen is something nobody really knows. I just wrote for Bloomberg Business Week about Madame Lagarde. You worked at the IMF. We seem to have institutional fatigue, and we seem to be looking for the ECB or the IMF to once again come in and save the day or at least delay the crisis down the road. If that is the case, does the head of the IMF have the support of the United States to go into Europe and get this fixed? 
Well, I, I think Europe is going to resist any outside uh, interference to fix it. Uh, and certainly they have the voting power in the IMF to, to resist that. Uh, I think the problem is the IMF has not, pr uh, uh, has not asserted itself enough right at the beginning. They should have recognized that Greek debt was unsustainable right from the get-go and asked uh, for a write-down of Greek debt. That would have solved a lot of problems initially. Of course, hindsight is 2020. But now we are where we are. And well, what was initially a debt default is turning out into an exit from the euro okay. area and virtually what, what, what is equivalent to a Great Depression <clears throat> in Greece. I think this is a terrible situation. And folks, Professor Rajan really touches upon an immediate point. Paul DeGuar this weekend from the London School of Economics said exactly the same thing. There's got to be a write down. Why can't there be a write down now, like by Friday? Um, well, because, uh, you know, it's actually not that difficult because a lot of the debt that Greece owes is debt to official institutions. Yes. The reason there won't be a write down is because the people holding this debt, whether the euro area, the IMF, etc., want to see some action on Greece's part uh, to do the kinds of things which, is, which are going to restore growth in Greece, uh, such as, for example, the structural reforms they've promised, the reduction in the uh, excess government work because they have and so on. Uh, unless Greece shows some willingness to walk halfway, uh, I think the creditors are, are going to be very unwilling to just write it off without anything on the table. And, and that is really where we are stuck at. Uh, the, the Greeks are essentially, uh, certainly the parties on the left, uh, Mr. Tsipras, for example, are attempting a form of grand blackmail. Uh, we will threaten to leave the euro, and you will therefore make concessions without us doing anything. In fact, he's threatening to go the other way and hire more government mm -hmm. workers, increase the deficit even more. On the other hand, the Germans are saying, well, we've had enough. You've done nothing. We've had three renegotiations, and we still are going in for a fourth, and you haven't done anything to show that you're serious about doing what it takes to come back uh, into the, uh, uh, to come back as a serious economy. So uh, what we have here is one of those situations where rational thinking may go well, out of the window and we get an irrational outcome. That's nicely framed. Look at this chart, folks. This, I'm going to give credit here to either Jim Hurtling at Bloomberg or Ambrose Evan Pritchard at the Telegraph. I can't remember. I'm too tired. A 27% decline in Greece GDP from the beginning of the crisis to the end of this year. That was one estimate off their negative 6% GDP today. Rajan, if we're in search of an institution that can be an arbitrator between the north and the peripheral south, I go back again. Who is the institution? Who is the grown-up in the room? Uh, it should be the IMF. It Where should be is the, the IMF? IMF? Where is the IMF? I, 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 I wish they took a more uh, proactive role and I wish they got ahead of the euro area and said, here is what needs to be done in the interests of Greece. Forget the euro area. First, let's start with Greece. And then the euro area is incidental to what happens to Greece. You can't let a country essentially uh, bear the kind of pain that Greece is bearing. But of course, the Greeks are right. partly responsible for this. So we shouldn't forget that. Well, good. Professor, thank you so much. And congratulations, folks, in foreign affairs, and the true lessons of the recession. And here's a wonderful book, Fault Lines, which uh, is still timely, won all sorts of awards, FT Book of the Year at one point, I believe.